Hi friends, Christy Teji here, your host for the Productive Passions Podcast. Let me ask you, is there something different you dream of doing, but don't know where to begin? If you're feeling suffocated, anxious, or you feel there's something different calling you, come along with me for candid conversations with people who have embarked on a journey to put their passions to work for them. Buckle up and enjoy the ride. Life is too short to stay stuck. Welcome to today's episode of Productive Passions. We kick things off with a poignant quote from the legendary Philip Seymour Hoffman, reminding us of the essence of pursuing one's vocation. Hoffman once said, study, find all the good teachers and study with them. Get involved in acting to act, not to be famous or for the money. Do plays. It's not worth it if you're just in it for the money. You have to love it. In this episode, I had the pleasure of sitting down with the talented Isaac C. Singleton Jr., a seasoned screen and voice actor. Join us as Isaac takes us on a journey through his passion for acting and the path that led him to the vibrant city of Los Angeles, where he has contributed to some truly amazing work. I can't help but be reminded that the beauty in life lies in the love we share and the passions we wholeheartedly pursue. In a world often fixated on fame and fortune, let's not forget to find love and joy in the things that truly matter to us. Now let's dive in with Isaac and share in his celebration of the art, the passion, and the profound joy of living a life dedicated to what we love. Isaac, thank you for saying yes to joining me on the podcast today. It's so good to see you. Well, it's nice to see you also. Thanks for inviting me. I did a little bit of research, and actually, we've known each other for several years now. Mm -hmm. Uh, But I did a little bit of research, and I learned a couple things. I learned several things about you that I want to ask you about today. But first, what I want to ask you is to tell me how we met each other, because I tell the story of how we met each other, but I thought it would be a lot of fun to hear you recall how we met each other. This is what I remember, because like you said, it's been so many years ago. Yep. We were sitting next to each other on an airplane, I believe. I know you kind of started getting handsy with me, grabbing my thigh and stuff like <laughs> I'm just kidding. That is no. so not true. <laughs> It did not happen that way. <laughs> anyway, we met on an airplane. I don't know. We just started having a conversation. And I think I started referencing the fact that my sister was an occupational therapist. And you started trying to tell me about what you did and things like that. And then found out that my sister didn't live too far from where you live. I was living in L.A. at the point. You know, I was just flying back and forth, going to different places and seeing family or going to do projects elsewhere. So that's how we met from I remember being on an airplane with you. Yes. Okay, so here's how I remember it. I remember being at the airport, in the L.A. Mm -hmm. airport, waiting to board, and it was a Southwest flight, and I had their business class, which meant I got to be one of the first people on the airplane. So Mm -hmm. that flight, they were boarding the front and the back of the plane, and I got on, and I went to my what I call my assigned seat, which was always the emergency exit. So I get there. That's my seat. (laughs) No, that's my seat. Southwest, you got people fighting over your middle seat. Not your middle seat. The emergency, the emergency row exit seat. row with the leg room in it. Right. For people who are six foot five who need the leg room, yes. So I get on the front of the plane and walk to the emergency row seat. And I sit down in the aisle seat. And I usually sit in the window, but that time I decide to sit in the aisle. And then here you come. And I look up and I'm like, there is no way <laughs> I could take this seat because in comes this guy who's 12 feet tall. And there's, it's not fair for me mm-hmm. to take the aisle seat. So I gave you that seat and sat down next to you. And then we did talk. I remember you doing one of your voices because I said something like, if you were in character and you were a bad guy and you had to rush off this plane, what would you say? And you did one of your deep voices. Can you do that for us now? People of Earth, the shadow of Thanos darkens your world. Submit to my will or perish. (laughs) 
Yeah, I think if I heard that coming from behind me, I'd probably like lay down in the aisle and let you crawl over me. Before we got on the plane, I knew you were somebody because people were coming up to you and talking to you in the airport. So I was like, huh, that's interesting. I wonder who this guy is. And then I end up sitting next to you and I learned who you are. So interestingly, since then, one of the things that I've observed about you that I really respect is when people come up to you, you don't say, I don't have time for you. Don't bother me. I've had dinner with you at a restaurant several times where people have come up to you. I don't know if you remember, one time a kid came up to you and said, my dad said he knows you. Can I get your autograph? Can I get a picture with you? Do you remember what you said? I don't because it happens often, and I just know that I'm very gracious to these people, and I'm very happy to give them an autograph or a picture because that's the kind of guy I am. I'm very happy and very friendly, and I'm very thankful for the work that I've done. I know I'm not above anybody else as a human being, and so why not give them a minimum of my time? Why not? That's exactly what I've learned about you is that you are very gracious, and people are so grateful for that. So that is something that very much impresses me about you and that I appreciate about you because that little gesture can make the difference in somebody's life. Mm -hmm. So on my podcast, Productive Passions, I talk to people who followed their dream, who followed their passion, despite what people may have said, despite the odds against them, whatever those challenges were. The reason I wanted to talk to you is because I can't imagine deciding to be an actor and have no connections and having to navigate that by yourself. Mm -hmm. When did you know that you wanted to be an actor? Well, I got some signs from God when I was a sophomore in college. Signs have been showing me since I was four years old. And what happened when I was four, everybody would say, Isaac, what do you want to be when you grow up? And so I don't think in letters and numbers, I think in pictures. I always have film reels running through my mind, pictures, things that are constantly going, or people, when I think about things in the future and the past. So when I was four, I always get this vision that would run through my mind of a bunch of people sitting in a room. The room was dark, and these people were sitting in the dark looking at this light. This blue light was shining on their face, and looking at the light with interest. But that vision would disappear, and I'd answer the question. So I could see what they were wearing, where they were sitting in clothes, everything. And so when I was four, I wanted to be a mad scientist, okay? That's why I'd say I want to be a mad scientist. Then as I got older, I wanted to be a football player. Then I wanted to be an eye doctor like my dad. And then in eighth grade, I settled on wanting to be a commodities broker. That's what my goal was, to be a commodities broker. And I kept that goal until my sophomore year college. But no matter what age I was at or where I was at, every time someone asked me what I was going to do for a living, that vision of those people would appear. I'd answer the question. The vision would disappear. And I go on about my day as if, oh, okay, well, this is, I just answered the question. So what? It was, it was no real thought behind it. It just was what I was going to do. So anyway, flash forward to my sophomore year of college. I'm at Florida A&M University in Tallahassee, Florida, historically black university. I'm an economics major, and my goal is to be a commodities broker. But that semester, I decided I was going to take a theater course as one of my electives because I've been in public speaking since I was ninth grade. I like acting and stuff like that, but I never thought of it as a serious career. I just thought of it as some fun stuff to do. So I right. took the theater course, and while I'm doing the theater course, a director at my university asked me to come audition for one of the plays, and I got the lead in the play, and the play was called The Bad Man, and I was playing The Bad Man. That same semester, the markets made a major recorrection, which means they went way down, and I started evaluating, well, why do you want to be a broker, Isaac? And the pros and cons list. The pros list was very short. I can make a lot of money. The cons list was getting up at 4.30 in the morning to look at the markets and being ready for the markets, trying to build clientele lists, the distress of making people money, all these different things. I'm like, man, that's going to be a daunting task, too. So what the heck? I'm praying about it. I'm thinking, well, what the heck? I'll go see a movie because I could afford a dollar. There's a dollar theater in town where you can go see a movie. I didn't have a car. So I walk across my campus, walk across Florida State's campus to get to the dollar theater because I can afford a dollar. What the heck? Sure. I get into the movie theater. I pay my dollar. I'm sitting in the theater. The lights come down. Movie starts, and all of a sudden, this voice inside of my head said, Isaac, turn around. You're being serious. I'm dead serious. I'm not making this up. Okay. Okay. The voice said, turn around. When I turned around, I saw the exact people I've been seeing since I was four years old, where they were sitting, the clothes they were wearing, and the blue light shining on their face that they were looking at with interest 
was a light reflecting off the movie screen onto their faces. So I was like, okay, God, I guess. Wow. He's supposed to be an actor. Okay, now, so now. That's pretty powerful. Yeah, it was. And, you know, some people like, ah. Some people believe it like, wow, my hair is still on the back of my hand. So, right. You know, but it's true. This is what happened. And so now I'm walking home, and now I'm praying to God, saying, God, I'm in Tallahassee. There is no film or TV industry here, and I know I want to do film and TV, but I also want to finish college. What am I going to do? Because I want to do this acting thing. You show me the sign, and this is why I really love it, and I want to go for it. So I get to my apartment on a family's campus. I was living in what was called Palmetto Street Apartments. I get to my on-campus apartment. I walk in, turn the TV on. 11 o'clock news is coming on right then and there. The very first thing the newscaster says is, Hollywood has come to Florida. Universal Studios and MGM Studios are doing major film and television production in Orlando. And I'm like, wow, Orlando. Okay. Um, and I said, man, if I could finish college but also pursue the career at the same time, that would be great. But I don't know if any university in Orlando. I started researching and found out about University of Central Florida, which is one of the largest universities in our country now. Right. Go Knights. I transferred to UCF. All my credits transferred. I changed my major from economics communications. I finished my degree. I did a sales, couple of sales jobs out of college while pursuing acting, and eventually I got work, working on different TV shows there, working on live action stunt shows down there, and started making a living as an actor in Florida. And whatever movies came from California, I'd get on as a stunt man or an actor, or both, and um, made a living as an actor in Florida, and I had to move to California. I knew I had to move to California eventually, so I moved out here. I came out here, I, had, I was working at Disney at a show called Indiana Jones Epic Stunt Spectacular, where we yep, re- re- lost our on stage. Mm-hmm. I've been working at Wild West, but Disney was, that was an equity show I was working on at Disney. So I was able to actually save up enough money to where I didn't need a job when I moved to California for at least two years. I'd done a movie in Florida before I moved out here, and the woman who was the lead of that movie said, hey, when you come to L.A., because she said, you need to move to California. So I'm moving out there next year. She said, well, when you come out of California, give me a call. If you pay me $50 a month, I'll submit you in the breakdowns. The breakdowns are what casting directors send out looking for certain actors and certain looks. Mm-hmm. Okay. And then you send your actors in that look that way to play these roles. She said, if you pay me $50 a month, I'll submit you in the breakdowns. Whatever you get, you give me 10% of that, and I won't charge you the next month to submit you in the breakdowns. I'm saying that sounds perfect. So sure enough, I moved out here, contacted her. I got here May 28, 1998. Unfortunately, that's the same day Phil Hartman died, got shot by his wife, and I always figured I'd work with him, but that was gone when I got here. Yeah. But two months later, on my X-Files, my first job was on the X-Files, so two months later, on my birthday. So, yeah. What a birthday gift, huh? It was. And I was like, thank you, God. And then God I was, was going to say, me. lots of signs going on there. Mm-hmm. And then there's a, kind of like a side note. Sorry, by the way, why did I want to be a mad scientist when I was a kid? Because God's got a sense of humor. And he's like, why do you want to be a mad scientist? Because I saw it in the movie. Why do you want to be a commodities broker? Because I saw it in the movie. He said, yeah, I was I was going to ask you about that. Like, commodities broker. What kid at, in eighth grade says they want to be a commodities broker? I did. <laughs> but anyway, but yeah. He said, yeah, I said, you want to be a commodities broker? He said, I was trying to show you, because I saw it in the movie. And I said, yeah. He's like, I wasn't trying to show you. That you were supposed to be what you were supposed to be. Well, you weren't supposed to be what you saw in the movies. I wanted you to be in the movie. So what did your family say to you when you said, I'm going to pursue acting. I want to be an actor. Well, it's funny because I was living in Germany at the time. Because we home was Germany for me. I'd come to the States to go to college, but I'd fly back to Germany to visit my parents because we lived near a city called Bitburg. My dad was stationed at Bitburg Air Force Base. Got it. And so I came home in the middle of my sophomore semester and said, hey, I'm not going to be a commodities broker anymore. I'm going to be an actor now. And the great thing about it, my parents were very supportive. Like, okay, if that's what you want to do. And then, you know, my dad being a logical kind of guy, just like I am, he's like, you know, you don't have any nepotism and and you don't have any connections there, but if that's what you think you're trying, okay, go for it. So they did not try to dissuade me or tell me my dream was stupid or whatever. They were very supportive of that. That was one of the best things about it, you know, that they didn't try to dissuade me or, or turn me against it. And I'm very thankful for that also. But, you know, as far as a plan is concerned, my plan was mainly as far as making sure that I was financially viable to do it because L.A. is not a cheap city to live in. What advice would you give to somebody who has those naysayers that are saying, oh, man, that's a long shot. you got to pay the bills. Stay where you are. You'll get to retire one day. I say, first of all, they got to think within themselves, deep within themselves and say, okay, 
how can I make this come to reality? Because, you know, you get to the point where you're in a certain situation where, okay, you feel like you can't get out of it. But there's always a way to get out of something when it comes to work or that kind of thing. Because I know I've been heard of people who I mean, I just talked to a friend of mine today. She's been an actress for 30 years during the pandemic. She went back to school, became a nurse. And now she's a nurse, but also she's an actor now. So now she's got two skills she can use and, and she can do both. So it doesn't so, have know, to be one or the other. No, it doesn't have to be. There's people out there right now who I was talking to somebody else this past week. This person has a regular old job that they do on a daily basis, but their passion is photography, and they're now starting to get paid for their photography as they're building up their portfolio that way. And that's what they really have a passion about, but they still do their other job because that's when it's still paying their bills. So you can find time to make things happen for you. I mean, you're not packed full of stuff every single day where you just wake up and go to sleep at night, sleep maybe eight hours, and wake thing, next thing you do, you wake up the next morning. You know, I have time to do is work all day long, except for having meals in between and then go back to bed again. That's not really a life then, you know. I think that's really good advice. If you're not in a position where you can leave your job, you still, to your point, can look at beginning to explore some of those things that you really like to do as a side hustle or as to learn more about. So maybe one day it just becomes passive income or additional income. I want to switch gears a little bit. I'd like to talk about some of the roles that you've played. Can you tell me about some of the roles you've played? And then what are some of your favorite and why? The role I played in college, and I got the lead in the play, the play was called The Bad Man. And that was when I was at FAMU, and that was fun to do that. And a great cast of people I was working with in that. And it took place in the 1930s in Alabama or Mississippi, someplace like that. You know how race relations worked back then. So the black people lived in a little township away from where the whites lived. They had a lumber yard they ran. Anyway, something happened to one of the white people over in the town, and the white people came over and burnt down. They tried to burn down the whole city. But me being the bad man, I was married or whatever. But I was always really this mean, tough guy in the camp. But... When they came over and said, okay, well, we think one of you black people killed Mr. What's and what If you send out the one that did it, we'll let everybody else live. So my character pretty much gave himself up because they got me family, you know, kids, nothing like that. And I let them burn me to death at a stake, and everybody else got to live, according to that. Wow. So that's how that movie was. But let's see, that show was. So that was my first major kind of role in theater, and I did the other theater and stuff like that. But then I kept studying acting. Then I got my SAG card in Florida on a TV series called Tarzan, and I played the king of an African tribe that knew Tarzan, and we were friends and all that kind of stuff. That's how I got SAG card. SAG, or SAG after now, is pretty much a professional actor's union. That's the union that takes care of the actors, makes sure they get the right kind of contracts from the producers to take care of them when they're on and off set. And then eventually I started doing other things in Florida, other roles, then I got on an equity show at Disney, which was called the Indiana Jones Stunt Show. I played several roles in that. I played the giant who fights Indy around the airplane. I played the guy who jumps up with the sword and gets shot. I played the director of the show, the second AD of the show. I got on Arliss with Robert Wall. He was great. And um, the character that I played was a character named Greg Whitaker. He was a basketball player. And the funny thing about him was he wanted Arliss to get him, like, TV endorsement deals and stuff like that. But the thing is, whenever Greg Wicker talked, you couldn't understand what he said. So that was a comedy in that. You could understand what he said when he said, you know what I'm saying? And so that's what the joke <laughs> was in that one. And then after that, and I got on Galaxy Quest and then Planet of the Apes. And my first joke to myself was like, every movie I get, they just want to cover my face. It's like Galaxy Quest was three-hour makeup every single day. Then I got Planet of the Apes. That was a four-hour makeup every single day. Yeah, I can and imagine. Man, Hollywood doesn't want to see my face. What's wrong with oh. my face? You've got a beautiful face. You've got a beautiful face. Thank you. Thank you very much. You're so kind. I give it. <laughs> you do. You absolutely do. And then after that, I got a few other shows. Then I got on Pirates of the Caribbean. And that was like, oh, they want to see my face finally. And that was, that was a lot of fun to get on that one. You have been seeing tasering Adam Sandler and slapping Kira Knightley. Are there any other fellow actors you've assaulted? You just said I tasered Adam Sandler. Untrue. I did not taser Adam Sandler. My character tasered Adam Sandler's character in a movie. And Isaac Singleton never slapped Kira Knightley. The boatswain on the Black Pearl slapped the woman named Elizabeth Swain. 
that was a totally different thing. That's not me. That's them. So this is kind of like the Deadpool thing where it's just pretend. Yes, yeah. I never smacked Kira Knightley. She's a lovely I, lady, I, very nice. I think I'm beginning to understand this acting thing. These are just characters, and it's I all in the script. It's not like I just walked uh, and said, I'm going to smack her. No, it was in the script, and I did what was in the script. Oh, see, I was thinking you got mad at her, slapped her, they caught it on camera, and there you went. They're not that see, and then they put it up for the world to see. Isaac Singleton, the actor, was just angry that day, smacked an actress on set, and then they kept it in the movie just for the fun of it. No, right. It looked good. I've also been at the opposite end of that, too. You know the great Anthony Hopkins? I do. He beat me to death with a stick in Jamaica in a movie. Oh, so, yeah. So I was in a movie called yes, Instinct. Yeah, so I was just trying to shoot at some gorillas he was living with. I was a poacher, and he came up behind me, hit me in the back of the neck with a stick, and then beat me while I was on the ground. Oh. Is that nice? No. <laughs> Anthony, we have to talk. We don't treat friends like that. Well, I'll tell you, man, Anthony Hopkins was a consummate gentleman and a spectacular guy to talk to. I mean, that was before I even moved to L.A. when I did that movie. I was still living in Orlando. And I got to do that show, and I got that on a stunt contract, and I got to go to Jamaica and shoot that movie. And uh, we were in the jungles of Ocho Rios and just talking. And he was a really cool guy just to talk about him and his starting career and who he liked. I remember he telling me, like, James Cagney when he was younger and stuff like that and just listening to his stories. I mean, I'll never forget those moments with him. I totally respect what actors do and the art of it. That's something I've learned, actually, being your friend, is the art of it. and also. There's been a couple times I had to memorize lines to talk about something. Holy cow, that's hard. Yeah, there's sometimes lines are hard to memorize. Sometimes are very easy to memorize. It depends on how the character itself resonates with you. That makes sense. And also the kind of thing the character is saying and playing that kind of just your brain just connects to it right away. And you're like, oh, yeah, I know what he's going to say next because this is what he does. That's part of it, too, right? It's your job. So you're very comfortable and you're good at your job because you've been doing it. It's not my job. So it's nerve wracking to try and memorize and get everything perfect. And so, again, that experience just makes me respect the art of acting that much more. Major athletes can get them out of trouble in the real world as opposed to what they do on the field. They just were like big babies, couldn't manage themselves. So. He would always have to take care of the craziness that his athletes did off the field or off the court. And so my character was a character named Greg Whitaker. He was a basketball player. And the thing about Greg Whitaker is he saw his other colleagues making money in commercials and doing public speaking gigs. So he's like, Ernest, I want you to get me these jobs, too. But the only problem with Greg Whitaker was when he spoke, you couldn't really understand what he said because he spoke in such a. Can you give us an example of what that was? What did he sound like? Let me put it this way. I went in for the audition, and they said, Isaac, we tried to script this, but well, we couldn't. So would you just please make up a story right now? We want to understand what you're saying, but not understand what you're saying at the same time. You can understand what he said when he said, you know what I'm saying? I read something about a movie that you did where the, I think it was the director had you like just stop on the side of the road and shoot a scene. That was a different movie in Mexico we did. And that was kind of guerrilla style shooting where he just would like no permits, nothing, just all of a sudden stop on the side of the road. And we just like, OK, let's everybody let's out in here. And then we would like walk through the sand dunes and shoot over there and stuff like that. Yeah, that was not one of the best productions I've ever been on. But I mean, I, once again, it was an experience. Yeah. And I did it. and I'm happy I did. It was an adventure. It definitely was. My favorite type of role right now, because I love doing the action comedy type things. So those are a lot of fun. Because, you know, Pirates was action, and it was funny, and it was also, it was kind of dramatic. All of that wrapped into one. That was really fun to do that. But I like being the size I am, so I get to play these big, brutish-type characters also, you know? Yeah. So that's just fun to me, because, I mean, I'm not that brutish type of a guy in real life, so I get to play different than what I really am. So a lot of times I get these plays mean characters. It's a lot of fun, because you really bring the mean out, because I'm not a mean guy in person. No, not at all. What has been the hardest or most disappointing thing that you've encountered? Okay, first of all, I like to think of it. I try to be as positive as possibly can. Yeah. I don't think about the hardest or the most difficult. I'll tell you what I found to be frustrating when I moved here, and I still encounter it to this day, is the fact that people 
when they see me, and I understand when it comes to casting, I have a certain look about me, and I know that. I know that. Everybody has a certain look. There are certain guys out here who think they're going to come out here and be leading men, and they just don't have the leading man charisma or look about them. There's a lot of roles out there that I can play, and some people just think, oh, he's just a big guy with a deep voice. It's happened many times where I've been on a set where I've actually done a role that wasn't necessarily written for me, and they're like, wow, you really can portray that role. I'm like, yes, but you too busy thinking of me as more of a big lummox type of a person to realize that I I know I'm an intelligent man. I've been a lot. I've seen a lot of the world. I've been a lot of places. I've been down to a lot of cultures and I've seen a lot of different situations and situations that I definitely can play. But, you know, people don't I have to show them constantly over and over again what I can do because they assume from other people who don't have the same skills I have, who just were the brutish big guy. That's all that guy can do. And that's not me. That's all. Right. Right. So if there was anybody that you could work with, you could work with anybody you wanted. Who would that be? This is an actor out there, a big, tall guy, Isaac C. Sibleton Jr. I'd like to see him in almost every movie out there, and I'd like to work with him in those movies, yes. What is it about Isaac that makes you want to work with him? Because when you get Isaac on set, he is very professional. He's fun. He's going to be on time. And that's mainly your job. Is you come on set, be professional, be on time, treat everybody nice. And I mean everybody. Not just some of the people. I think about one of the reasons why I was able to get Pirates of the Caribbean is because I was nice to an extra on Planet of the Apes. And the reason why that was, when I used to work in Florida, I used to do extra work back then, just to get on set, just to learn. And so when I got on Planet of the Apes, now I'm one of the leads. And they also had a core group of extras they brought with us everywhere, because it was like, you know, they had to have the background guys. So they, you know, they brought these core group of extras wherever we went, Toronto Pinnacles. Lake Powell, Arizona, all these different places we shot that movie. And, unfortunately, they treat extras like second-class citizens a lot of times on movies. And I remembered my experience of being an extra. I'm like, you know what? When I become the lead, I'm not treating extras like that. I'm going to treat them with respect because they deserve it. And a lot of them are great artists. People just don't know. So, sure enough, one of the guys on the movie kept constantly talking to me about his art and all that kind of stuff. And I'm like, hey, man, more power to you. Anyway, last stand shooting. He brought in a actual vacuum form of the CMOS character, and he said, hey, man, I thought you were cool. He gave me the vacuum form. We exchanged phone numbers, and that was that. And then two months later, he called me up and said, hey, Isaac, man, Dizzy just came to my studio. They looked at all my swords. Remember I told you I'm an armor? I thought, I remember your armor. He said, yeah, I'm an armor. They came and looked at my swords. They're going to do this movie called Pirates of the Caribbean. You should try to get in that because they want a big Samoan guy for this character, but I think you'd be right for it. Then that's when he sent me on the journey down the road to get to that try to get that thing going, get that movie. And I eventually got on it. So that was very thankful for that. And to thank him afterwards, when I got the film, I got this gigantic gift basket, you know, and I took it over to his studio, gift to him and his wife and his crew. One thing that I know you're not shy about talking about, in fact, you've already spoken about it here, is your faith. Mm-hmm. So I think that being a part of who you are, that's, Part of what influences the way I'm sure it's more than a part of what influences the way you treat others. And like I said, I've seen that time and time again, just in our interactions, in interactions with people who just come up with you in stories like this. Do you think that that's part of the reason that you treat people the way you would like to be treated? That's one of the major parts of it. I'm thankful that I had a mother and a father who were very loving and both in the household. And I'm very thankful for that because we had a loving family. I'm the middle child. I have an older sister and a younger brother. We were all together this past Christmas. My two nieces, one at Brown now, and one of them is in 11th wow. grade. And all of us were together, my brother and his wife and everybody. So I'm the only one that's not married in the family. I'm thankful for the lessons my parents taught me growing up. And a lot of those tenets are in the Bible. And those also were tenets that were in our house, how to treat people, how to be a human being in the world, good citizen of the world, that kind of thing. And that, in my opinion, shows a carry on and how I treat people now. And it does. I don't do the film industry because I want to be famous. I don't even think about fame at all. I'm in it for the fun and the money. I got to eat. This thing takes a lot of fuel. I'm not trying to be famous. A couple months ago at an event, this guy goes, man, I want to be famous like you. And I said, well, I'm not famous. I just happen to have gotten some great roles in the past, and I'm always looking for the next one. 
but I'm not famous. I'm just a working actor who's just having a good time with life. And he kept telling me how famous he wanted to be and how he wanted to be in the film industry because he wanted to be famous. I said, well, why do you want to be famous? And he was like, yeah, I want people back at home to know who I am. And I came from the Midwest and all this kind of stuff. I'm like, okay, well, but don't you want to do it for the love of the art? Because it's art. He goes, yeah, well, yeah, yeah, I want to do the roles, but I want fame. I'm like, okay, I can't tell you what, what you want. I can't tell you what's right or wrong. I just know I'm not in it for fame. I'm in it for the fun and the money and the art of actually doing the roles and making people happy, seeing what I bring to life on stage. If fame comes from that, okay. It's not about the fame for me. It's all about the fun. It's a lot well, of fun to be in like life. Yeah, you do an extraordinary job of becoming that character, and I know that's what it is to be an actor. One of the things you talked about a little bit earlier is your voices, and we did a little bit of that. Mm-hmm. But I'm wondering, when you have to do a role and you come up with this voice, did you come up with that, or do they tell you, we want you to sound like this? Okay, whenever I get my voice or auditions from my voice or agent, Sometimes they'll send me a picture of something, and they'll give you a description of what they want this character to be like. They'll tell you what the character is. And what he, so you read the character descriptions, the character, what it is, and then you make up the voice from that. But there's been times also, like I've worked for World of Warcraft many times, you know, and they'll invite me down to Irvine to their actual offices down there to do recordings. And there's one time or a couple of times I've gone in there, like, okay, I said, we want you to do three voices today. We've got three different creatures and this one looks like this, a whole picture. This one this looks like this. This one looks like this. This one looks like that. What do you? Th- and then they'll say, what do you think this thing sounds like? Because they're the engineers. They don't know what it sounds like. They just know it's some kind of creature, and they know it's going to be in the game. But I get to make up the voice for them. So I'll give them, like, three voices right then and there and say, okay, and they're like, well, that's the voice. We'll go in and do the creature in that voice, come out, and then we'll pick the next voice and do the next one. So you do it. You pick the voices, or you give them options and they choose. Yeah, I make up three voices right then and there for them because I've got a lot of voices in here. You do. So one of the voices I know you do is Thanos. Yeah, I was very thankful. Marvel, I got to work for Marvel and do Thanos for their cartoons, for Avengers Assemble and Guardians of the Galaxy. And then they also hired me to do it for their video games, too, and also did it for Black Panther Lego Movie also. What does that he is- sound like? Thanos is nine feet tall, and I think he weighs 900 and something pounds. Oh, crap. But you also got to know his personality, what he thinks about. He's thinking about world domination, okay. universal domination. In other words, his philosophy is just let me make all the decisions, let me do what I want to do, and then everybody else will be just fine, okay? If I want to get rid of half the population of the whole universe, that's great because then that's more resource of everybody who else is left. Oh, that's his philosophy, you know, that kind of thing. He's in love with death. Death is an entity, not a tick state, an entity. He loves okay. her, and he's always trying to impress her. But he's also a very robust character, so he's not going to have some, Hi, I'm Thanos. Come look at me and uh, listen to what I have to say today. Thanos is like, I am Thanos. World domination is what I'm going to have. No one argue with me, ever, because I'm always right. That's him. That's who he is. So how would Thanos approach death to ask her on a date? He does things that just try to impress her. That's what he does. And by he impressing do? her, then he'll get to, you know, that's pretty much. He just wants to impress her. So how do you impress death? Uh, well, probably by doing a lot of things that cause her to have more people in her coffers, meaning more death upon her. <laughs> oh. But like I, I said, you. if you don't have more people in the universe, there's a lot of people that are dead, death gets them, and then there's more resources for everybody else. Win-win. Win-win, yes. <laughs> win-win situation in his mind. So you've also done Darth Vader? I've done voice for Darth Vader and some things also, and I even did it in a live show at Orlando for Universal Horror Night one time. Yeah. And, and I did a recording for the voice then. Yeah. What does Darth Vader sound like? Darth Vader was voiced by one of the greatest voice artists in the world. I mean, James Earl Jones is the pinnacle of voice over. That man has got something else going on in there. I mean, yeah, he's great. I got to meet him at Universal Central Florida. He came down to do a speech one time. And I was flattered because the first thing he said to me when he met me, he said, you said you could play Jack Johnson. 
And I was like, wow, that's, well, okay. You know, because that was one of his first film roles. And sure enough, when I moved out here and I went to American Academy of Dramatic Arts for the summer program, they, they had me play the Great White Hope, and I was Jack Johnson in that. You know, it was kind of neat to do that scene with this girl. It was fun. But, you know, but Darth Vader, she's very smooth, very, like, matter of fact also, you know. You are a rebel spy, and, a, you know, one of my favorite lines is, what does he say? He says, your thoughts betray you, my son, for a sister. So you have a twin sister. Obi-Wan was wise to hide her from me. Now his failure is complete. And if you won't convert to the dark side, perhaps she will. That flow of voice, he's just so good, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, you know, it's interesting because when I first met you, that's exactly what I thought. I was like, this guy sounds like James Earl Jones. You have that deep voice. I'm proud that I have continued to make a living at this year after year. I live debt free. I'm proud that I'm a human being that people know has integrity. I'm proud of the fact that I have parents who loved me and treated me well, and they still treat me well and taught me some great lessons in life. I'm proud of the places I've been in the world. I mean, last year I went to Germany. I was in Amsterdam. I had a great life. I've got a great life. I get to travel. I mean, I just have had, I'm proud of the different things I can do. I mean, proud that I got graduated from college. There's a lot of things I'm proud that I've accomplished and stuff. But I'm also proud that I came out here without any nepotism whatsoever not really knowing anybody at all. I had to come out here and just grind constantly to just get these roles that I get. I hear somebody who doesn't have a lot of regrets. And I think the reason you don't have a lot of regrets is, again, the human being that you are, the kindness that you show people, the integrity that you live your life. And I really hope to see you in more movies coming up or more shows because I've seen you acting. I enjoy your acting. You've got the big voice. I could see why they put you in the roles they do. I would love to see you in a tender role. Would you ever do a Hallmark movie? Yeah, sure. I like that. I would do a Hallmark movie. But if you got to pick whatever it was that you wanted to do next, what would you be doing? I still like trying to stay in shape, so I would really love to continue. I'd love to do another action-type film where I'm uh, the good guy, you know. I was just going to ask you, are you the good or bad guy? Yeah, but I like playing both. The bad guy gets to say the best lines, not the good guy. If you think about it, the bad guy gets to say the good stuff. Real fun, snappy, good stuff, because the good guy's got to say certain things to make the audience realize he's a good guy, you know. So things like, I'm not going to do a voice, but, like, I'll be back. Well, he was a good guy and a bad guy. He was a bad guy in the first movie, but after that, he was a good guy. So, you know, the Terminator was a good guy and still could say, I'll be back. So, yeah. How does it go? Well, the way he said it is, I'll be back. That's (laughs) very just like monotone. It's not like, hey, I'll be back. No, it's like, (laughs) I'll be back. (laughs) Imagine if he was like, hey, I'll be right back. I was just going to ask you, like, deliver that line in three different ways. Imagine, like, okay, he just ran. He just left the police station that first movie. He's like, I'll be back. He walks out the door and then comes slamming a car through the front door of the police station. Would have been funny if he was like, I'll be back. You know, he could say it that way or like, I'll be back. <laughs> I'll be back. There's several ways to say it, but he's just nice, Mono. I'll be back with the accent. I'll be back. You know, he came back, all right. <laughs> so, yeah. I sure did. Serious question. Can I accompany you on your next premiere? Sure. I'd be more than happy to have you accompany on my next premiere. Yeah. So you're single. Are you interested in meeting someone? Yeah, I'm very interested. I'm always interested in meeting someone, you know. Definitely. Okay, so what makes a good partner? What are the qualities in someone that makes them a good partner? For me, what would make a good partner is someone who is not combative, who doesn't like to fight, doesn't really like to argue. Someone who can talk as opposed to yelling. That's for me, because I don't really like yelling. Someone who can actually really have good conversations. I definitely want somebody who's intelligent. you got to have somebody to talk to. you got to talk about all kinds of things. There's so many things in the world to deal with. Someone who loves to travel. Someone who can do things outdoors and indoors. I mean, I like going camping and hiking and things like that. But also going to museums and seeing cultural events and stuff like that. That's fun for me. Someone who's easygoing and fun, can go with the flow. Someone who actually works out and stays in shape, 
eating right, that kind of thing. There's so many more. One of my main things, I want somebody who definitely is a believer in the Lord, because that's a foundation of relationship for me. And that's something that will carry us all the way through, even through the tough times. When you've got the Lord, you can always work things out, I think. I really do. So I will put in the show notes your social media handles. But if somebody wanted to reach out to you that had a question, what's the best way to reach you? Because hmm. I'm not well, getting out the cell phone number. I am on Instagram. You know, it's Isaac, I-S-A-A-C, then Singleton, S-I-N-G-L-E-T-O-N, and then Junior. That's my G. Sometimes I get messages from my agent that people have contacted him looking for me and all that. But usually it's about a, being on a show or a podcast, something like that for them. But, yeah, I mean, that's pretty much it, you know, I can think of. I mean, on Facebook, too, that's Isaac C. Singleton Jr. on Facebook. But as long as I feel Isaac right, you know, Isaac C. Singleton Jr. I know that you had a supportive family, which makes yeah. all of the difference in the world. I would say you're blessed with the family that you come from. Mm-hmm. I'll also what say this. Like- like you said, support. I remember when I went back to Germany and told my parents I was going to be an actor. I remember one of my teachers, he wasn't ever my teacher, but a friend of mine's dad was a teacher at school also. That in my high school, and I go back and visit people at the high school, and I told him, oh, I'm going to be an actor now. And I remember this teacher started laughing, laughing. And I'm thinking to myself, okay, I know I'm funny, and I tell a lot of good jokes, but I'm not joking. This is what I'm thinking inside my head. But he was laughing at the idea of me becoming an actor. And I'm like, okay, well, that's what I'm going to do. But once again, it's, you know, some people just, they don't believe in other people's goals sometimes. They just don't believe because sometimes they probably didn't go for the goal they might have wanted to do, you know. Maybe it's less about you and more about what they did not pursue, what they did not mm-hmm. do, not in a judgmental way, but maybe it was out of fear. So yeah. being brave enough to follow your dream, to follow your passion, to see where it can take you. But also, I remember God said, this is what you're supposed to do. I'm like, okay, well, I figure if God's telling me to do this, I'm not going to fail at it. Obviously, i got to go for it. So there you go. That's called faith. Yeah. Well, Isaac C. Singleton, mm. Jr., it has been an absolute pleasure speaking with you, as always. And I can't wait to see what you do next, because I do know how talented you are. Thank you for joining me on Productive Passions. Well, thank you very much for inviting me. And I had a great time. Probably could have talked about a whole bunch more, but hey, there we go. Ah, we'll have dinner some other time and catch up. All right, then. Sounds good. Mm-hmm.